Hey troops, what's going on? Gen Did Commando here. My name's Ryan and I'm a former Royal Marine from the United Kingdom and today we're going to be reacting to the crazy rescue mission of hijacked aeroplane Operation Enteb. So this is going to be kind of a military reaction I guess. I mean it depends on the response to this rescue mission but I'd imagine it would um, have military intervention involvement. Okay so um yeah, before we get into it, like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Support me on the road to 100,000 subscribers. We go on, we're getting there pretty quick, guys, okay? So I just want to say thank you to everyone who's supporting the channel. I really do appreciate it. But without any further ado, let's get straight into it. Boom. It's June 27th, 1976, and an Air France Airbus is taking off from Athens, Greece, en route to Paris. Aboard the flight are 248 passengers, most of them are Israelis, along with 12 aircrew. Amongst the passengers, however, are two Palestinian and two German terrorists, and shortly after takeoff, the three men and one woman reveal concealed weapons and threaten to murder passengers if the flight is not immediately diverted. The aircrew radios their situation to the ground authorities and changes heading for Benghazi, Libya, where the plane lands and is refueled. Seven hours later, the plane departs and finally lands in Entebbe airport in Uganda. Outside the plane's windows, the hostages see scores of Ugandan troops and are briefly relieved, believing themselves about to be rescued. Yet as the plane's doors open up, an Ugandan army colonel strides up the emergency stairs and shakes hands with one of the terrorists. The right, okay, so what would you do in this situation then, troops? You're on a plane, you're going to from point A to point B, just a normal flight, and then suddenly all of this starts happening then you finally think you're going to be rescued and actually you know you're not the terrorist shakes hand with the terrorist so to speak ugandans are not here to liberate the hostages they're here to protect the terrorists soon after wow. one of the hijackers contacts international media with their demands they want a ransom of five million dollars for the release of the airplane along with the release of 53 palestinian and pro-palestinian militants from prisons around the world if their demands are not met they will begin executing hostages on July 1st. Back in Israel, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin phones U.S. President Gerald Ford, asking him to contact the Egyptian government and request their aid in negotiating with Ugandan President Idi Amin. Egypt, not particularly friendly to the Israeli situation, promises to do what it can. Meanwhile, the Israeli cabinet furiously argues back and forth on whether they should give in to terrorist demands or not, and prepare that's actually a good question, guys. What do you think we should do in situations like this? Do you think we should set a president and always give in, pay the ransom, or do you think that kind of lays the law down to let these types of things happen a lot more? I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with the probably the um, the no holds barred uh, version of just just don't don't agree, don't comply at all. All right, I don't think it works prepares to release the 40 Palestinian prisoners that they are holding. The US and Britain, however, are adamant that they will not negotiate with terrorists and inform Israel that they will under no circumstances release any of their prisoners. The American and British stance is a harsh one, but a logical one. If these terrorists and their demands are surrendered to, then it will only encourage further terrorism. Meanwhile... Exactly, that's my point. Uh, do you really want to pay it just for a short kind of win? Then they'll think, hey, you know what, this is going to work. We'll, uh, we'll keep on doing this. Egyptian President Anwar Sadat attempts to negotiate with Amim, but makes no headway. He then turns to the Palestinian Liberation Organization and surprisingly gets Yasser Arafat to send his political aid to Uganda to negotiate with the hostage takers, though the hijackers refuse to see him. A political situation is quickly becoming untenable, but the Israeli government asks the hijackers for another week in order to buy themselves more time. President Amin, who has been in contact with an Israeli Defense Force officer whom he had a long personal history with, agrees to negotiate with the terrorists after he is told that Israel is preparing to release their prisoners. The hijackers release 48 non-Israeli hostages on the 30th of June, and after agreeing to a deadline extension, release another 100 non-Israelis, all of which are flown to Paris. This leaves 84 Israeli hostages, 10 French hostages, and the air crew of 12 who had refused to leave with the earlier released hostages. With their Why would they have refused to have leave with the, the earlier released hostages? I don't get that. Unless I've missed something here, guys. Drop in the comments why. 
extra time, the Israeli government breaks into furious discussions on how to proceed, with many wanting to agree with the hijackers' demands in order to gain a release of the rest of the hostages. Yet others, mostly those from the intelligence and military community, refute the idea, warning that this will only encourage further terrorism. With the pressure mounting and the US, Britain and now France adamant that they will not negotiate with terrorists, a final decision is made. There will be no negotiation. Instead, the Israeli Defense Forces will mount a rescue, leading to one of the most incredible military operations in history. With only a week left before the noon deadline of July 4th set by the hijackers, IDF commanders convene an emergency meeting to determine a strategy for the rescue. One idea. Right, so how would you even think about rescuing these individuals from the plane? For me, if the military is already being corrupted on the other side and they're aiding this process, it's going to be very, very hard to um, rescue the hostages without any loss of life, especially when you're fighting against the military effectively. I think, you know, there's probably going to be a lot of negotiations to stop that from happening, but once the negotiations break down, that's when there's going to be loss of life simple as that is to have naval commandos airdropped into lake victoria which borders the entebbe international airport where the hostages are kept dropped into the lake the commandos would inflate rubber boats and ride them to the airport where they would engage and kill the hijackers and then hold their position and ask president amin for safe passage home the plan is almost immediately shot down for one, the Israelis are told that the lake is infested with Nile crocodiles, and there are serious concerns about Ugandan President Amim's support for any rescue operation. Rather than allow the rescuers to fly home, he might order an attack on the Israeli forces instead, which would lead to a slaughter. The Israelis have two major problems to overcome in devising a realistic rescue attempt. First, they need more solid intelligence on the airport and its layout. And secondly, they must get the assistance of an East African nation for the raid, as the Israeli military lacks the capability to refuel four to six military aircraft so far away from Israeli airspace. The Americans have a huge airborne refueling fleet, but in order to get their tankers on station to support the Israelis, they too would need the permission of several African nations to fly through their airspace. And such a plan risks tipping off a meme to a pending rescue. Yeah, I think if you kind of went down that route, it would definitely be tipped off. I mean, corruption exists all over the world, so I can imagine that being, you know, the first port call is to, to grasp them up, you know, and that, I think that's what would happen, and the mission would be stumbled from the start. Rescue attempt. Instead, the Jewish owner of a hotel chain in Kenya, along with other prominent members of the Jewish and Israeli community in that nation, all pressure Kenyan President Jomo securing Kenyan permission for the IDF task force to cross into their airspace and refuel at what is today Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. Further, Kenyan Minister of Agriculture Bruce McKenzie persuades President Kenyatta to allow Mossad agents into the nation so they can collect information across the border on the Entebbe airport. Within 24 hours, Israeli Mossad agents have crossed the border into Uganda en route to... Right, these Israeli Mossad agents are some of the best fighters on the planet guys all right not not an awful lot is known about them but they're very very highly trained individuals and this mission for them will be nothing really scout out the airport and its defenses other Mossad agents meanwhile have flown to paris where they're conducting interviews with the released hostages one of them a french jewish passenger with a military background has an extraordinary memory and is able to provide information not just on the airport but on the hijackers and the number and types of weapons they carry all this information is relayed back to the IDF, who have also contacted the Israeli construction company, which had actually built the exact terminal where the hostages are being kept years ago. Building a miniature replica of the terminal, the Israelis begin to piece together where the hostages may be being kept and prepare their strike force. The plan is risky, but simple. Four C-130s would take off from Israel and head to Uganda with a strike force of 100 commandos who would assault the airport terminal, secure the airport against any Ugandan military forces responding to the attack while the planes refuel, and then fly everyone home. The men are split into three elements. Ground Command and Control consists of a small group, including the Ground Commander, Brigadier General Dan Shomron, and support and communications personnel. The assault element consists of a 29-man assault force, led by Lieutenant Colonel Yonatan Netanyahu, and made up entirely of commandos from the elite Sayeret Matkal unit. They will be the spearhead of the assault and are tasked with breaching the terminal and rescuing the hostages. The security element is the largest. 
Right, this mission sounds absolutely fantastic, guys. I'm getting excited just thinking about how they're gonna, you know, the logistics of it, how they're gonna all piece it together and then strike. It's gonna be, it's gonna be good. This, I'm looking forward to it. Largest element and is made up of three parts. A force of paratroopers will secure the airport field, clear and secure the runways, and protect the aircraft while they're fueling. The Golani force will secure the C-130 tasked with rescuing the hostages and board them, while also acting as general reserves and reinforcing where needed. The Sayeret Metcal force will clear the military airstrip nearby and destroy a squadron of MiG fighter jets on the ground to prevent any possible interceptions by the Ugandan Air Force. They will also repel any attack by Ugandan military forces responding from the nearby city of Entebbe. The plan is set and with time nearly running out late in the evening of July 3rd, just hours before the July 4th deadline, the strike force loads into their waiting C-130s. The four-plane flight takes off and flies over the Red Sea at a height of no more than 100 feet. From wow, 30 meters. That is crazy. That is, that is crazy, guys. In their windows, the soldiers could see waves breaking below them. As the airplanes roar along at almost 400 miles an hour, the strike force is flying fast to avoid radar detection by the Egyptians, Sudanese, and the Saudi Arabians, fearing that if they are detected, the mission may be given. 30 meters troops is so dangerous, I can't even begin to explain. Yeah, especially at 400 miles an hour. That's, that's insane away. Plus, there is the added concern that any one of these nations, not currently on friendly terms with Israel, may decide to intercept the flight. The Israelis, after all, did not gain permission to penetrate or approach their airspace. While flying at 30 meters lets the Israelis avoid ground-based radar, if any military aircraft happen to be in the sky, they would be very quickly detected by airborne radar. And so far out of range of Israeli jets, there would be no hope of protecting the strike force from hostile. Yeah, they would be dead straight away troops. Attack. Nervously, the pilots keep an iron grip on their control sticks. At such low altitudes, the smallest mistake will send them plummeting into the ocean, just a hundred feet below them, disintegrating the massive planes on impact. Trailing behind the Strike Force's C 130s are a flight of two Boeing 707s, civilian transports that have been retrofitted with medical facilities, and a command post for the commander of the operation, General Yakutiel Adam. Hours later, the planes have landed at Jomo Kenyatta International Airport in Nairobi, Kenya. One of the 707s, the medical support plane, is left behind. Right, I wonder how they've landed there without, well, they have got permission, but I wonder how they've landed, managed to land there without anyone else kind of noticing then. While the other five planes are refueled and take off for the assault on Entebbe International Airport. On approach to the airport, the remaining 707 circles overhead, allowing General Adam to remain in contact with his forces on the ground. At 2300 hours, the four C-130s all make a combat landing on the airport's runway, their cargo bay doors already open and ready to discharge the men inside. In the darkness though, the first plane almost taxis straight into a ditch, but wow. the other three land without incident. From one of the C-130s, a black Mercedes made to look like President Amin's personal vehicle rolls out followed by two Land Rovers, all bearing the insignia of the Ugandan president. Mm -hmm. Inside each vehicle are Israeli commando. That is so smart, guys. That is really, really smart. Hoping to be able to roll past two known security checkpoints. However, as the vehicles approach, one of the sentries orders the cars to stop. He knows that Amin has recently purchased a white Mercedes and is suspicious. As the vehicle rolls to a stop, Lieutenant Colonel Netanyahu orders the commandos inside to shoot the sentries. The commandos fire- This is- this should be made into a movie, guys. I'm literally blown away with this. ...two shots at the sentries using their silenced pistols and roll away. Yet, as one of the Land Rovers approaches, they realize the sentries are still alive. Orders are clear. There can be no sentries left alive who may raise the alarm. The last Land Rover pulls to a halt, and an Israeli commando hops out, killing the two sentries. Upon hearing the gunshot from the commando's unsilenced rifle, the assault force fears that they've been given away, and the vehicles roar to the airport terminal at high speed. Meanwhile, armored personnel carriers are being hurriedly unloaded from the other C-130 planes. One force of armored vehicles hurries to the main entrance of the airport to set up a defensive position, should Ugandan military forces respond from the city. The other immediately roars to the adjacent military airfield and begins to rake the 11 Ugandan MiGs with cannon fire. Ugandan <laughs> wow, so he's absolutely destroying, destroying these vehicles like it must be absolute mayhem. Pilots rush out from their barracks in a panic, but upon seeing their planes being destroyed by heavy cannon fire, flee from the airfield. In moments, all that remains of the MiGs are smoking wrecks riddled with heavy caliber machine gun fire. 
On the flight line, the security element has fanned out around the C-130s as the planes begin to refuel from onboard fuel tanks. The mood is tense and suddenly gunfire is heard from the direction of the airport control tower as the Gulani force comes under fire from Ugandan army forces. Back inside the terminal, the commandos burst into the building. One of the soldiers uses a bullhorn and screams in both English and Hebrew, stay down, stay down, we are Israeli soldiers. Unfortunately, a 19-year-old boy stands up in the confusion and is immediately cut down by the commandos. Oh man, that's such a shame. Commandos, who believes that he is one of the hijackers. Another thing is with this kind of game guys there's always going to be collateral damage blue on blue situations happen all the time it's just an unfortunate thing hostage is also fatally wounded by the commandos in the confusion but the rest dive to the floor and keep their heads down one of the hijackers the german wilfried bose rushes into the hall holding the hostages and brandishes his ak at them but a moment later seems to have a change of heart instead of firing at them he orders the hostages to seek shelter in the bathroom then turns and starts firing at the commandos. In moments, he is cut down by Israeli gunfire. See, why? What, what are you going to achieve? I mean, what's the point in what he's just done there? Uh, One of the commandos asks the hostages where the rest of the hijackers are, and the hostages all point at a door inside the terminal's main hall. The commandos quickly form an assault team lining up on either side of the door and toss in three hand grenades. As soon as the grenades explode, the commandos burst through the doors to discover the wounded and stunned hijackers who are immediately shot dead. With the building secure, the commandos rush the hostages to the exit and hurry them along to a waiting C-130. Outside though, the Gulani force is under assault by a platoon of Ugandan soldiers, most of which have holed themselves up in the airport control tower. From their vantage point, the Ugandan soldiers begin to fire down at the hostages as they're being loaded into their C-130. But the Israeli armored vehicles respond with their automatic cannons. Cannon fire blasts the concrete structure, eliminating many of the Ugandans hiding within. But return fire wounds five of the commandos and kills the assault element's commander, Lieutenant Colonel Yonatan Netanyahu. Oh man, you're joking me. So the main man's been took out. This is a, oh, it's a sad way to kind of close this whole video down, man. In response, the Israelis fire a rocket-propelled grenade into the tower and strafe it with machine gun fire, effectively silencing any opposition within. Loading the rest of the hostages and Netanyahu's body onto the plane, the assault force is quickly in the air. The entire operation has lasted only 53 minutes, Incredible. with the assault itself only lasting 30 minutes. Seven hijackers, 33 to 45 Ugandan soldiers, and 11 Ugandan MiGs have been lost to the Israeli commandos, and only three hostages have been killed, with 10 wounded. The C-130s fly to Nairobi and link up with the waiting medical plane, which immediately begins to treat the wounded as it climbs into the sky and heads for home. In the aftermath of the raid, Israel faced international condemnation from many states, with a resolution raised in the UN by Benin, Libya, and Tanzania condemning Israel for what it called provocative actions. Though it Hang on a minute, should they really be kind of downtrodden because of what they did? They literally took the hostages out from a situation which they were trying to otherwise being bribed to kind of give money and everything else for. I mean, do you, do you agree with that? I, I don't think they really did anything wrong in that respect. It was not put to a vote. The Ugandan and Israeli representatives were summoned before the UN Security Council after a complaint was filed by the chairman of the Organization of African Unity, charging Israel with an act of aggression. The Ugandan foreign minister claimed that the hostage situation was nearing a peaceful diplomatic resolution, while the Israeli ambassador charged Uganda with being fully complicit in the hijacking. In the end, a general resolution condemning international terrorism and calling for stronger civil air security without condemning Israel's actions was raised, but failed to pass in the General Assembly. Most Western nations would go on to praise the Israeli raid, with representatives of the UK and the USA congratulating Israel on an impossible operation. Uganda's President Amim, however, was furious and threatened direct military action against Kenya for their support of the operation. In response, the US dispatched the supercarrier USS Ranger and her escorts to the Indian Ocean and based it off the Kenyan coast, ready to respond if Uganda followed through with its threats. While he did not take direct military action against Kenya, Amin did order the murder of one of the hostages who had been left behind, Dora Block. You've got to be kidding me. A 74-year-old Israeli woman who had been taken to the hospital after choking on a chicken bone. 
Ugandan military officers showed up at her hospital room and dragged her out of her bed before fatally shooting her, that along with several Ugandan doctors and nurses who tried to intervene. That Amin is would disgusting. also go on to order the killing of hundreds of Kenyans living in Uganda in retaliation, with as many as 245 Kenyans killed by July 11 and 3,000 fleeing the nation as refugees. Was the that was absolutely disgusting. That ended on quite a sour note, actually. Do you agree with um, Amin's decision to go and kill that woman who's seven, over 70-year-old in the hospital? Man, how eh? That's, that's really bad, like. That's really, really bad. But that was one of the best kind of videos I've reacted to, the rescue mission of a hijacked airplane. That, that really did um, get my... You know, get my thought pattern going. It really grabbed my attention, guys. I loved that video. If you liked it, like, share, and subscribe to the channel. We're on route for 100,000 subscribers very, very soon, guys. So I just want to say a thank you to each and every one of you guys for supporting the channel. Members, you guys are the best. I wouldn't be able to do this without you. If you want to become a member, press the join button or hit the link in the description, guys, to join and support the channel. I'd really appreciate it, okay? And um, other than that, I'll see you next time. Peace.